Good morning, everyone. It is so nice to be back. My family and I were uh, visiting uh, Grace's parents and her brother uh, in Northern California. Uh, there for about 10 days. Uh, nothing like flying back into YVR. Nothing like seeing green again. You know, after being in California, it's nice and sunny there, but they do not have the evergreens like how we do, and everything is um, fresh and alive in some ways, and so it's always nice to be back. Uh, if you're new with us, uh, my name is Phil, one of the pastors here at Hope City. Uh, if you have any questions about the church or if you'd like to get connected, I'd love to chat with you. Uh, a couple questions or a couple uh, comments before we dive into um, our sermon today. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone who commented on my very pink shirt. Um, if you, you know, can guess uh, which movie I, I'd love to see very, very soon, um, Oppenheimer for sure, but I want to say that I got this shirt way before Barbie came out, okay? Some of you are wearing, uh, there's a blue one, and I think, um, you know, we all got to pick these, right? All, we all got to select different colors, um, and so I got to pick this about three or four years ago um, before Barbie and Ken decided to make it to the big screen. Um, another thing I want to say is I want to thank you, Ling, for really starting us off um, on what God is doing through his calling and covenant with Abraham. The next couple weeks we're going to spend together, we'll be exploring Abraham's journey of faith, Abraham coming alongside what God is doing to make the world new again and rescue it from sin. And so, so far in our journey uh, through Genesis, we've looked at the beauty of creation. We've spent a lot of time looking at the results of the fall and the pain that resulted from sin entering into the world. And now through Abraham, we're going to spend some time looking at the beginning story of God's work of redemption. That's what we're doing now. God has started a new work. He has spoken it into existence, speaking, calling Abraham and his family into this new work that he's going to do to redeem the world. But today we're going to stop at chapter 16 of Genesis. We're going to be exploring the story of Hagar. Uh, hands up, how many of you have ever heard a sermon on Hagar? Specifically, one, okay, out of many of us, some of us. Three or four. Okay, good, good, good. So not just, you know, this won't be completely new to you, but actually as I grew up in the church and I'm 42 right now, I have never heard a story on Hagar. Whenever we go through this part of Genesis, it's always about Abraham and Sarah, and then we get to Isaac, right? There isn't a, a sermon necessarily about Hagar, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to dive into her story because Scripture lifts her up and provides her story as something that's important for us to know and meditate on. This is the story of Hagar. She's actually the female slave of Sarai. The title of the sermon today is Hagar. And this is what she says. She proclaims in the passage that we explore today. She says, God, you are the God who sees me which is a profound thing to say about God because it expresses Hagar's reality where no one truly sees her except God. And that's what we're going to see in this story. No one sees her except God. To everyone else, to Abraham, to Sarah, she is just a female slave, no personal rights. They don't even refer to her by name in this narrative. The narrator does, but they do not. She is reduced to a category, specifically that of a slave, rather than that of a person. And perhaps just looking around the room and knowing our own story, some of us know what it's like to be invisible to those around us. Or if we're not invisible to those around us, we know what it's like to be seen and looked down upon. Perhaps they don't see us or they look down on us because of race or ethnicity or origin. Perhaps it's because of gender. 
Perhaps it's because of socioeconomic status. Perhaps it's just our lower position on the org chart and we don't matter. Or maybe it's our health issues. Maybe you and I know what it's like to be reduced by others. Perhaps you know what it's like not to be seen by others or to be looked down upon. A few weekends ago, my family and I, uh, we were down in Seattle for a soccer tournament that my son Micah was playing in. Uh, They were playing teams from all over Washington, all over Oregon. And at this tournament, uh, he had his first experience of racism. Long story short, one of the opposing players on the other team called him, and I will edit for language, an effing Asian. Okay, he called him an effing Asian. And um, after the game, he and I told Grace, uh, or he told Grace and I what was going on uh, while we were driving back to the hotel. Again, uh, my two girls were in tow as well. And at the hotel, you know, it's about a good 20 minutes uh, from the soccer field. So we had a pretty good family discussion on things like racism, how God made each person in his image imbued with his value everlasting, that we are all the same and wonderful and yet different in God's eyes. And our differences is what makes us wonderful. He made those differences. And we also talked about how we are to respond to racism as people who follow Jesus. And the kids got to ask some of their questions and and Grace and I got to answer them the best that we could. And then things got silent. And in my mind, I was driving. I was like, oh, good. The kids are really thinking about this. You know, this is a part of their world, part of their life now. You know, and in a way, I was like patting myself on the back for guiding them through this pivotal moment in their lives, right? Uh, Coming into their own as Asians who are followers of Jesus, And then breaking that silence is Kayla, my six-year-old. And she has this to say to kind of like wrap everything up for us. She says, well, Micah, at least you're not an effing racist. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm just telling you now because she starts grade one in in, in September. Uh, I know she's got grammar, you know the use of words, where adjectives go, but I expect a couple calls as well uh, this fall. Uh, How we deal with that, I guess we're gonna have stories for another time. But by just looking around in this room, we come from all over the world. I think in some ways you and I understand what what it means to be reduced by others, to be reduced by how they see us, And Hagar, of all people in the first 16 chapters of Genesis, she lives this. This is her story. That she is not seen for who she truly is. But God is the one who sees her. That's the story we're getting into today. I also want to say, just as a caveat before we dive in, Scripture describes life as it is, not life as it should be. This episode we're exploring today is an example of that. Scripture doesn't sanitize the sins or the failures of the people that God chooses to partner in his work to save and rescue the world from sin. So Scripture describes human beings, even the people that God chooses to be his own people, as they are, not necessarily as they ought to be. And that includes Abraham and Sarah. They're not perfect people. They struggle to believe what God says he'll do, what he has promised them that he'll do. They make mistakes, and sometimes they make some horrendous ones due to their wrestling with their doubts. And all of this is part of the journey of faith of God's chosen people. These are the people that he's chosen to be his own, to work with, to bring salvation through. Scripture also describes the cultures um, and the times that God's people live within. And God's people are broken people living within a broken world. They live within the norms of an ancient Near Eastern culture and society where slavery is a fact and a reality. And even God's people participate in it without any qualms. And I wonder what this 
is saying to us. If anything, if we look at Abraham and Sarah, and if they're not perfect people, and God still decides to bind himself to them and work in and through them, I feel like this is good news for us. This means we can come to God and wrestle with our doubts, wrestle with our fears, unpack all that we have a hard time understanding. We don't have to get it all right away. We do not have to be anywhere close to perfect because that's not who God chooses to work with. He chooses to work with people who are willing. In this passage here, I also want to tell you, we are going to read about slavery. We're going to read about patriarchy. It does a number on the lives of the people in this episode. And I want to say that all of this patriarchy, all of this slavery, it is described, it is not prescribed. This is not scripture saying that this stuff is okay. Rather, scripture is merely saying, this is what the world looks like when sin has entered in and broken our relationships to a point where it looks like this. This is the way things are, not the way things ought to be. And in this episode, you and I will see why. Okay, so that's where I want, that's just a, a bit of introductory stuff before we dive in. Let's dive into the passage. It begins uh, Genesis 16, this is verses 1 to 2. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. This episode that we're exploring today, it begins when Sarah and Abraham, by extension, they begin to get worried about God, worried that God will not follow through on his promise to give them a son and build a family through them. A bit of background just so that we can understand why they're anxious, why they're worried, why they're wrestling with doubt at this point. In Genesis 12, and I think Euling did a masterful job covering this for us a few weeks ago, when God called Abraham, he promised him two things. He promised him land, Canaan, this is the promised land, and he promised him family. And Abraham and Sarah at this point, they were childless at this point. And, and God promised Abraham and Sarah that he would make them into a great nation, a tribe, many descendants. And so there are two promises involved. There's a promised land and a promised family. And to be honest, if you're going to take land, you're going to need people. And so in order to have promised land, you're going to need the promised family first. Abraham understands that. God promises Abraham land and family as a foundational step in making Abraham such a blessing that he is going to bless the entire world. Again, this is not just about legacy for Abraham. This is not just him building a family, generations, and descendants. This is not him having land, having real estate, all of these pieces are so that God can bless Abraham so much that he can be a blessing that reverberates through the entire world. But by Genesis 15, and I think Euling covered this with you last week, Abraham actually asks God. He says, hey, God, are you still with us? You know that promise you made? Are you still with us? Because Sarah and I are still without a child, and as Yu Ling went through with you guys, God in response makes a covenant with Abraham. He tells him that his offspring are going to be like the stars in the sky. They're going to be too numerous to count. He makes a sacred commitment by binding himself to Abraham and this promise. And to give you a sense of why Sarah and Abraham may have gotten worried about God's willingness or God's ability to follow through on his promise... Abraham is 75 years old when God calls him and blesses him, promises him land and family so that he will be a blessing to the world. He's 75 years old when God calls him and makes the promise to him. By the time 
Sarah, his wife, gives birth to Isaac. Abraham is 100 years old. And Sarah is 90 at that point. They are well past childbearing years. And then if we look at the timeline of what Abraham and Sarah's family looks like, Ishmael, as we're going to find out, Hagar's son, born to Abraham, is born to Abraham when he's 86 years old. So all of this is happening about 10 years after God has initially, initially made his promise of family to Abraham and Sarah. 10 years after the promise. 10 years, after 10 years, they check in with God. God, are you still with us? Is that promise still valid? Do you still hear me? Do you still see me? Are we still on your radar? Anyone who has ever struggled with infertility will tell you how difficult it is with each passing year as the pressure mounts to have a child. Sarah was already 65 when the promise was made. Here now in this episode that we're exploring, she is 75. So there's 10 years of living with an unfulfilled promise. That's her reality. And it's within that she decides to take matters into her own hands. We're given insight into how she sees her own inability to have children. We're told that she sees her childlessness as the initiative of God. The Lord has kept me from having children. That's her conclusion after waiting for 10 years after the promise, where nothing is happening. Her solution, though, and again, she's resourceful. Her solution is that she's going to give her slave Hagar, who is young, of childbearing age, to Abram as a wife, as a surrogate to build a family through. This was common ancient Near Eastern practice. And she says this, perhaps I can build. Perhaps I can build. I don't know if you hear it, but it echoes the builders of the Tower of Babel who wanted to make something of themselves rather than let God make something of them. Again, this also echoes Eve's approach in the Garden of Eden. She decided to take for herself because she couldn't trust God to give something good to her. There is no consultation with God. Sarah doesn't consult God. Abram doesn't consult God. The reality of Abraham and Sarah's calling is that it did require radical faith in God. It it required trust that he would provide both the land and this miracle child. Both would be a miraculous work of God. Both would not be a human work. So right away, we're given the sense that Abraham and Sarah, they begin acting outside of God's intentions for them. And all that we see unfolding as a result comes from their lack of faith, comes from them in their lack of faith, taking things into their own hands, taking matters into their own hands. This is verses three to four, and it reads like this. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Again, uh, Abram and Sarai did not consult God with this plan. They do not consult Hagar. She is simply treated uh, as property, not as a person, And this is per the societal norms of those times. Again, just because it's the societal norms of the times doesn't make it right. Scripture is, again, describing life as it is, not life as it should be. And the result of this is that Sarah gets everything that she planned for and nothing that she hoped for. Hagar is pregnant with Abram's child, and immediately the family dynamic changes. We don't know how this is expressed, but the text tells us that Hagar began to despise her mistress, to look down on her, to disrespect her, to be insubordinate to her. 
And if we look into the ancient Near Eastern laws, there were actually laws that governed this exact circumstance and situation because of how important it was in that culture at that time for a family of means to produce an heir. If the wife could not produce an heir, perhaps, according to the ancient Near Eastern laws, a concubine or a second wife could. There were laws after conception that protected both the legal position of the first wife. She could not just be cast aside. She could not be supplanted. But it also, on the other hand, protected the life and the rights of the concubine who produced the heir. The surrogate's life still matters. Simply put, the the wife could not lose her standing in the family to the concubine, but the concubine who produced an heir, even if she disrespected her mistress, she could be disciplined and assigned the status of a common slave, but she could not be sold. She could not be killed. That's not how it worked. This is some attempt at rights and justice in a very broken world. The story goes on. This is verses five to six. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms. And now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar so that she fled from her. Sarai, now dealing with uh, the blatant disrespect from Hagar, appeals to Abram as the male head of the household in the ancient Near East to deal with this dynamic, this situation. And in Echoes of Genesis 3, after the fall of humanity, she shifts blame to Abram, even though all of this was really her plan to begin with, Abraham, kind of like Adam, he shrugs off the responsibility as well. He doesn't do anything. He says, well, you just do what you think is best. And Sarai, in her appeal to get Abraham to do something about this conflict in the home, appeals to a higher court. She says, if you don't do something, God will. May God judge between you and me. You better do something, Abram. And his decision, once again, is to leave things into her own hands, into Sarai's hands. The end result is not good. The end result is that Sarai mistreats Hagar. This is the same word that is used to describe the mistreatment of the Israelites, the Hebrew slaves, at the hands of their Egyptian overlords. Both Sarai and Hagar, both are in the wrong. Sarai for being harsh and oppressive, Hagar for being unrepentant and and insubordinate at this point. But it should be noted that this entire situation was created by Sarai in the first place and Abraham in the first place for going along with it. The irony is that Sarai, victimized by barrenness and later on victimized by Hagar, now becomes a victimizer. Sarai's abuse of Hagar results in Hagar running away. The story goes on. So she runs away, and verse 7 and 8 reads like this. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where Are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. In order to understand what is going on here, there's a specific term that I want to unpack, and that term is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord shows up in various parts of scripture, and each time this term is referring to an angel, a heavenly being, who is acting as the personal angel agent of God, like God's personal representative here on earth. And in the ancient Near East, we have similarities to this. A king would have a personal messenger. Uh, He would send this messenger in his duties to conduct business on his behalf. 
and it would be expected by other nations and dignitaries that they would treat this messenger as if he were the king himself. He is the king uh, embodied wherever he goes, right? So the angel of the Lord is like this. And so the angel of the Lord would be speaking and interacting with Hagar as God himself would. And what we learn right away is that the angel of the Lord found Hagar. He didn't just happen to come across her in his travels. He wasn't on his way to deliver a message from God to someone else and and just came across Hagar. He didn't come across her accidentally. The angel of the Lord intentionally looked for Hagar after she fled Sarai. And this tells us that this God of ours looks for us in our misery and in our pain, even when it's caused by God's own people. Our God looks for us in our misery and our pain, and he finds us. The scripture goes on, when he finds Hagar, Hagar is in rough shape. She is on the road to Shur. That's what the text tells us, which tells us that she's on a road trying to return back to Egypt. But if you know anything about the geography, the road is long. She has no provisions. She's pregnant. She's on foot. It's the complete wilderness. It's desert. And here she happens to find a spring or a well. She's at this well probably because this is her last drink before she dies. There's, this is no place for a pregnant woman to be. Physically, she will die of thirst. Socially, she's alone. She's escaping oppression. The angel of the Lord finds her, and the very first thing he does is he calls her by name. Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm going to unpack what he says here because it's profound. Yes, God knew her lot in life. He knew that she is a female Egyptian slave, but he also knows her name, which stands out because in this entire episode, while the narrator knew her name, Abram and Sarai simply refer to her as your slave, my slave. It's impersonal. To them, she's property rather than a person. But when God calls her by name, he proclaims that her station in life does not define her. God treats her as a person. That even when the people he has called and made a covenant to, people that will bear his salvation into the world, when they fail to treat her as a human being and as a person made in the image of God, he nevertheless will. In a society that is patriarchal to this extent, in a story that is Israelite and Hebrew-centric, in a culture that saw slaves as property, where Hagar throughout her life was treated as a nobody, God calls her by name. And then God asks her two questions. He says this, where have you come from? And where are you going? Glenn Packiam, a pastor of Rock Harbor Church in Costa Mesa in California. Uh, Also, he's uh, an author of many books. He says this, he says, when God asks a question, he is not launching an investigation. He is staging an intervention. When God asks you and me a question, he is not trying to convict us. He is trying to save us. He is more interested in rescuing you than finding fault with you. The two questions that God asks Hagar are about her origin, where have you come from, and about her destiny, where are you going? You can just imagine that sitting at this well, Hagar probably thought that she knew her origins and her destiny. She was a slave from Egypt. Her life has been marked by poverty and oppression. She is property 
That's her origin story. And in that moment, she probably thought that she also knew her destiny as she was dying of thirst. She would die at this well with her unborn child. In her life, she was a slave, a nobody. In her death, she would also die as a slave, die as a nobody. Again, this is not an interrogation. When God asks questions, he is staging an intervention. He is going to do something in Hagar's life to turn things around. And this tells us that when God comes to us and asks, where have you been and where are you going? He knows where you've been. He knows where you're at. He knows where you're stuck. And he cares about where you're going. The story goes on. This is verses 9 to 12. And then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. A couple of instructions that God gives Hagar. You need to go back to Abram's house, back to Sarai. You need to submit to her. And I want to make it clear that this is not because God approves of how Sarai treated Hagar. It's not because God condones slavery, but because in this situation, there was no other way for Hagar's life and the life of her child to be saved. She could not survive on her own in the wilderness. She needed to return to Abram's household, be covered by God's blessing over Abraham and all that he has. Later on, we do see when it was time to leave, God would provide for her and her child in a new way. We see this in Genesis 21. We read that God was with the boy as he grew up. I don't know what image of God comes to mind for you when you think of God. I grew up thinking that God would only bless a very small number of people, these people who please him by living their lives according to strict definitions and rules. But the more I encounter the scriptures, the more that I see it, it doesn't work that way. God doesn't just bless Abram and Isaac. God blesses Ishmael. God is with Ishmael as he's growing up. He's with his family, causing them to thrive and become nations as well. God's blessing is, is so great. It's lavish. It runs over. But back to this episode, God also wanted Hagar to know that she would share in God's blessings, be a part of what God is doing. She is not outside of God's blessing to the world. She is not an outsider. She is not unnamed. She is not unseen. So much so that God would bless her by proclaiming, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. I don't know if you caught that, but that's exactly the same blessing that God gave Abram in chapter 15. That his descendants would be too numerous to count, just like the stars in the sky. That's the same blessing that God gives Hagar here. Right at the beginning of God's story of redemption, God is going to do something that is going to bless the whole world, save the whole world through Abram. But while he's at it, he is blessing everyone as he goes. She is going to share in God's blessings. God makes this clear. His blessing is for all. It's for Abraham in such a way so that one day through Jesus, the whole world will be blessed and saved. But God's heart is also so great that it covers uh, all that he has made. And we see this in him blessing Hagar. Hagar may know her origins. She may think she knows her destiny. She may think that she will die of, of starvation and exposure and, um, and thirst at this well. But God has a future for her and for her unborn child. 
She has a destiny, a glorious one, one that's even greater than she's ever imagined. It's evidenced by her son's name, Ishmael, means God hears. God hears her cries of misery. The story goes on, verses 13 to 14. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roai. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. How does Hagar respond to all that God has proclaimed and promised to her? When Hagar saw that God wanted to bless her, her life and her outlook is transformed. She's no longer gloating about being pregnant. She is in awe of God's love and care for her. And she responds by being the first person in all of the scriptures, not just the book of Genesis, to actually name God, to give God a specific name. And this is profound. This is a woman, a single mother, an Egyptian slave. God calls her by name. Abram and Sarah do not. And in response, Hagar is the first person in all of the scriptures to name God. I wonder what this tells us. To me, it tells me that God has this wonderful upside down way of exalting those who are vulnerable. Jesus tells us that the first shall be last because his father has been doing this kind of thing since the very beginning. Hagar names God El Roi, the God who sees me. No one else sees her. No one sees the image of God in her. No one else calls her by name. But God sees her, calls her by name, not only sees her misery and responds by blessing her and lifting her out of it. Hagar names God El Roi. She's telling us that she didn't just learn something about God, some concept about his goodness, some teaching that is passed on to her. She's telling us that through this interaction with God, she has seen God herself. She's seen his character, seen his heart. She knows that he is rich in mercy and abounding in love. The story goes on verses 15 to 16. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Hagar, as we find out, goes back to Abram and Sarai, gives birth to Ishmael. She goes from death to life because God has found her. To summarize, though, for Abram and Sarai, the tension of waiting upon God for this precious son, it just increases all the more. And in a way, this is what happens when we take things into our own hands. God will still do what he's promised to do. But at this point, we see things got complicated, things got more difficult. But for Hagar, who is, you know, the, the main character in this story here, in, at least in chapter 16, we see God rewriting her story. God is changing the way she will answer the question, where have you come from? Where are you going? And I think for us, this tells us that God is the God of our origins and God is the God of our destiny as well. God is the God of our past. He is the God of our future and because of our God, our past will not dictate what our future will look like. God's blessing will instead. The way your story starts is not how your story will end. It doesn't dictate that at all. Your future is in the hands of a God who longs to bless you, loves you, and he wants to include you in his work to make all things new again. Your life will be a journey. Your life will not be easy. God doesn't promise to shield us from the storm or 
from the desert, but to stay with us in the storm and to find us in the desert. And he wants you to know that his blessing is for you. So a couple questions for reflection and discussion for us. Where have you come from? How have your origins shaped you? Where are you going? What path in life do you feel destined for? And finally this, what part of your story or your destiny are you asking God to rewrite? Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God who looks for us. Uh, when we are lost, when we are in pain, when we are miserable, you look for us. You find us. And you call us by name. You know us. You see us. Pray that we would be your people who not only experience you finding us, seeing us, calling us by name, We'd be your people who see you intervene in our lives, rescue us. So much so that we would embrace your call to do the same for others, that we would be part of your work to make things new. We would be sent out, helping others see the one who sees us, rescues us, and loves us. We pray this in your name, amen.